Hello dear friends, this case is about the implantation of a toric IOL in a small pupil using pupil dilating device in a grade 3 nucleus carotid cataract. In such cases, I normally tend to block the patient, but now I am going to do this case under topical anesthesia and the supplementation of subconjunctival anesthesia. Now this supplementation works as well as a subtenon's block in my hands. This was described by Dr. Shruti Hegde, who was my colleague in a medical college where I worked. Using a bent 26 gauge needle, a small amount, say just 0.1 to 0.2 ml of lignocaine is injected in the superior and inferior limbus. Now, after injecting the 0.1 ml of the anesthetic, the anesthetic is then spread all around 360 degrees. This is called the ring of comfort, a term which was coined by my colleague. Now, once you press and spread this anesthetic all around, I think it travels along through the anterior ciliary vessels through the sclera and anesthetizes the ciliary body very well and patient is extremely comfortable. Even after a block, if patient experiences pain, sometimes I give subconjunctival supplementation which works very well in my hands. You can get away with subconjunctival anesthesia. It works really well and it is equivalent to topical phaco except that there is a higher chance of getting a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Now these are the toric marks that have been made under the slit lamp using a hockey stick blade. A little more supplementation of lignocaine which is given intracamerally because I intend to put the pupil dilating devices as well and then the anterior capsule is stained with tripen blue. So the clear corneal incision is now created. We create a Wong's pocket and then the main clear corneal incision underneath that. So once the clear corneal incision has been completed, the next step is to implant the pupil dilating device. The one which I prefer is the Gupta ring. You can inject this ring and this is a butterfly cartridge. This is very similar to the, the one we use for Indian foldable lenses. So once you put a little amount of viscoelastic into the barrel of the cartridge, the ring is taken and fed into the injector like this. So you have to create a diamond type of configuration. It requires just a little bit of skill to feed it in and make sure that you feed the loops right into the barrel because this will enable easy delivery of the device into the anterior chamber. So with a little bit of manipulation, you get the loops and feed it into the barrel. And once this is done, the device is ready for injection. So injecting the device can be done through the pre-existing 2.8 millimeter clear corneal incision. So you don't have to extend the incision. It is done in a very careful manner. The leading loop can be easily made to engage the pupillary margin. And if you are deft enough, you can engage the other two loops as well. So at one go, it is easy to engage three loops into the pupillary edge, as you can see in this video. Now once that is done, the trailing loop or the last loop is simply tucked by carrying it towards the pupillary edge and engaging the pupillary margin. Now once the loop is in place, it creates a square opening of the pupil. The capsular excess is then performed. One word of caution while implanting the Gupta ring, which is a mimic of the malogen ring. The loading of course in the malogen ring is a little different. So a capsular excess of adequate size is then created. It's easy when the pupil is nicely dilated in this diamond configuration. Like I said, the word of caution is that the loop of this Gupta ring should not lie underneath the clear corneal incision as it is in this case. Hydrodissection is performed, the nucleus is rising gently and the lens is rocked and I'm getting ready to perform phaco emulsification.
Now because the loop is underneath the incision, while inserting the FACO probe, I find that I am snagging this loop. So you have to be careful to make sure that you rotate the loop of the Gupta ring away from underneath the incision. Now this should be implanted so that it is away from the incision. But this will of course enable you to enter the eye without dislodging the ring. Armed with a sharp tip chopper in my left hand and with the FACO probe, uh, this is a grade 3 nuclear sclerotic cataract. I am doing direct FACO chop using a power of 40 in the multiburst mode and a burst duration of 30 milliseconds, a duty cycle of 70. So, in this case, you will see that although I am creating multiple small fragments and multiple chops, and I am trying to separate because of the leathery nature of the cataract, the crack is not really spread through and through and, and the posterior plate is not completely split open. So it just opens up like a flower petal. It looks as though the uh, fracture through the lens is complete, but in reality the posterior plate is still not opened up completely. This I realize when I am trying to mobilize the fragment and I find that it is still attached posteriorly and therefore it is reluctant to move forward and follow the FACO probe into the safe zone for emulsification. After realizing this, I create a deeper crack and then remove the central core. And now I think the mobilization of the fragments will become a little more easy. I am trying to make sure that the crack has gone through and through. This piece has come free and it has moved into the central zone and FACO emulsification is performed. Well, the advantage of the direct FACO chop is that you just need to have one setting both for creating the chop as well as for fragment removal. A single setting throughout the entire procedure. Of course, as you downsize the fragments, you may need to reduce the vacuum a bit especially in harder cataracts, but if you have good control over the foot pedal and if the fluidics of the machine is good, this step is really not necessary. Well, I use a dual linear foot pedal system which helps me to control the vacuum on the go and therefore I do not change the parameters while I am performing the direct FACO chop. So each of the fragments are then removed in a systematic fashion. At this point, I take a break to inject a little viscoelastic in the anterior chamber both to coat the epithelium as well as the endothelium. So while injecting or supplementing viscoelastic during the procedure, make sure that the irrigation is off as you are injecting the viscoelastic and do not over insufflate the anterior chamber. The last few pieces are then emulsified, always staying within the central zone. Feeding the pieces sometimes, but the fluidics is enough to propel the pieces towards the FACO tip. So this completes the procedure. The FACO emulsification part is over and it has gone without a hitch. Be careful that the posterior capsule is thin, it may trampoline and it may hit against the FACO probe and create a rent. You have to be careful when removing the last fragment. The cortical aspiration is then performed. Well, that also goes without a hitch. If you have a very good cortical cleavage hydrodissection, then most of the times you are left with hardly any cortex at all and you do not have a thick epinuclear shell. In this case, the cortex is removed with considerable amount of ease and the next step is the implantation of the intraocular lens. In this case, a toric lens has been planned and I have made the pre-placed marks using a hockey stick blade. I just enhance the visibility of the mark by leaching some blue dye onto these marks. And then I wash it off vigorously, which means all the blue dye is washed away except the ones that have leached into the cracks of the marks. Only those are left behind. This enhances the visibility of the marks considerably. I have no financial interest. This is a technostoric intraocular lens. This is a ZCU design. In this design, 
the haptic edges have been modified so that they have been little roughened on the outer edges so this provides a lens with additional rotational stability so using the pivot rotation i bring the lens to the desired axis of placement and then i drop it into place i make sure that the toric marks on the IOL as well as the toric marks or the reference toric marks on the cornea are all aligned coaxially and parallel to each other. And also by gently rocking the lens back and forth you can use parallax to confirm the alignment. This is possible only if you have a nice radial mark on the cornea as a reference mark and not a dot. So once the lens is beautifully aligned to the desired axis, the next step is to remove the Gupta ring. See how easy it is to remove it using a Sinsky hook. You just have to pry it out of the pupillary edge. Be careful while you do it because if you do it in a rough fashion, you can create hydrodialysis. Before attempting to remove the ring, make sure that all the loops are disengaged from the pupillary edge. Do it very gently. So once all the loops are disengaged, as you can see, you have to just fill the anterior chamber with a little amount of viscoelastic. I use an intraocular forceps to remove the device. So bring the device to an optimal position with which you can take hold of one of the loops or close to the loops, grasp it firmly and pull it out of the eye. The device easily slips out of the eye. You see there is very little distortion of the pupillary margin. However, there are multiple small sphincter tears that have happened to the pupillary edge. All the viscoelastic is carefully washed off. Once the viscoelastic is washed off, I come out of the eye. In this particular case, even though I created a wrong pocket, I used the butt compression technique. I saw a little amount of hydration that has occurred around the incision and I know this incision will seal. So only injected fluid from the side port and this helped to form the anterior chamber. The entire procedure was done under just subconjunctival anesthesia, 0.1 ml given at two separate locations and topical block and it works really well. I thank you for your attention.